This week on Vaticano, Pope Francis meets with Russian President Vladimir Putin at the Vatican. We examine this meeting in depth together with the Russian ambassador to the Holy See. Who are the Catholics of Russia and what does it look like to be a Catholic today in Moscow? We take you back to a trip our team made to Russia for an inside look. Fulton Sheen is one step closer to canonization and Cardinal John Henry Newman will soon be declared a saint. We hear directly from the Vatican's point man for saints' causes, Cardinal Angelo Becciu. Discover this and more on this week's Vaticano. For the third time in his pontificate, Pope Francis welcomed the president of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin, at the Apostolic Palace. The Russian delegation was made up of the Minister of External Affairs, Sergei Lavrov, government representatives, and the Russian ambassador to the Holy See, Alexander Avdiv. The tradition of their conversations is face-to-face -face with an interpreter. My president is very pleased with this meeting. It was really heartfelt, and they had a great political and philosophical conversation about today's world. One of the concrete steps to greater cooperation between the Holy See and Russia was the signing of a memorandum of collaboration with the Vatican's Bambin Jesu Pediatric Hospital and the Russian Ministry of Health. Bambino Jesu is one of the most famous children's hospitals in the world. There they do unique surgeries and organ transplants and neurosurgery operations. They save the lives of many children. We are grateful to the Vatican for treating 25 to 30 Russian children in this hospital every year, and all of them recover and return home, thank God, healthy. The hospital's experience and technical equipment are at the highest level. And yesterday, our Minister of Health, Mrs. Skvortsova, visited the hospital, signed a memorandum, and we agreed on scientific cooperation. This is Putin's sixth time in the Vatican and the third time he's met with Pope Francis. The series of meetings has certainly helped to establish greater ties with the Russian Orthodox and paved the way for the historic encounter between Pope Francis and Patriarch Kirill in Havana, Cuba in 2016. Catholic and Orthodox brothers, not always everything is smooth between churches, but everyone understands very well that only by working together both churches can overcome the new risks and threats that come to us in the 21st century. First of all, risks and threats such as the destruction of moral values, such as atheism, such as anarchy, spiritual anarchy, moral anarchy. But I think that cooperation between the churches and between our countries will help protect ourselves against these risks. Catholics in Russia are a minority. They're just 0.5% of the total Russian population of roughly 145 million people. Today the church can operate freely and in recent years has enjoyed the return of many churches confiscated by the Soviets. However, the process is not yet complete. Catholics in Russia await the restitution of the Church of St. Alexander in Kirov and the Church of the Immaculate Conception in Smolensk. Russia's ambassador to the Holy See offered a diplomatic way forward. I think in Kirov there is a solution. I know that now there is a very famous hall for symphonic music. There is a wonderful organ, excellent acoustics. So the decision comes naturally. It is possible to hold music concerts there and to hold Catholic services. And as far as I know, the local authorities are determined to solve it this way. As for Smolensk Catholic Cathedral, is historically connected with Poland, with Catholics from Poland, and with the Poles who come here today. I will say in this way that the better we have interstate relations with Poland, the easier it will be to resolve the issue of the church building. The issue of Catholic Church property may have been raised by Pope Francis during his conversation with Putin. The moment of the exchange of gifts was very symbolic. President Putin gave the Pope an icon of Saints Peter and Paul and a DVD of the film The Sin by Andrei Konkalovsky, dedicated to the figure of Michelangelo. Pope Francis, in his turn, gave Putin an etching from 1774 by Giuseppe Vasi, depicting St. Peter's Square. 
together with a medal celebrating the centenary of the end of the First World War. He also gave him copies of his writings, such as Christus Vivit and Gaudete et Exultate, and a personally signed message for the World Peace Day 2019. The two leaders confirmed that they have a common view and assessment of the world today, about destabilization of the world and destabilization of trade. Concerns about the destruction of very important treaties on limiting the arms race, on nuclear weapons and on missile technology, all of which are of concern to both the Pope and President Putin. Specific regions and topics were touched upon, Ukraine in the first place. It was noted that the whole world expects from President Zelensky concrete steps, at first to establish the dialogue with the residents of Donbass and Luhansk and to normalize the situation. In a few moments, we'll travel to Russia to discover the life of Catholics there. The Catholic Cathedral of the Immaculate Conception in Moscow was only once again used as a church in 1996. Catholic priest Father Kirill Gorbunov tells us more details about the history of this cathedral. This church that we are in right now is slightly more than 100 years old. And like many churches uh, in this country, this church was closed. Uh, it, it wasn't active as the Catholic Church for most of, 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 it, of, of its history. So built in 1911, consecrated in 1911. In the 30s, it was confiscated from the church, it was closed, it was turned into a warehouse. And uh, it was divided into several floors. The actual goal of the authorities probably was to ruin this church, just to make it disappear. But the, in the 90s, the first time that the, the Holy Mass was again celebrated here was on the steps of this church, because the church itself was closed for the believers. It was Christmas 1990, then little by little, Several rooms were given back to the faithful part of the first floor. You, can, you, can, you cannot see now uh, how small it was actually. And uh, this reminds us of, of the faith of the Catholic Church here in Russia, because the Catholic Church uh, in present-day Russia was absolutely destroyed, uh, absolutely forbidden, so um, only uh, a handful of clandestine priests. The community is very active and embodies the whole meaning of Catholicity. On Sunday, there are 11 masses celebrated in eight different languages. The church hosts four different rites, Latin, Tridentine, Eastern, and Armenian. The church plays host to a variety of gatherings and concerts as well. So after 25 years of being uh, in the Catholic Church here in Russia and also after uh, seven years serving as a priest here, I understand that our service, our work here is uh, done not only for the Catholics themselves, but a great deal of our service, of course, is aimed at the Orthodox Church. This dialogue is important for a true understanding of the Catholic reality. These two young people came to attend a youth mass. I have Orthodox friends, we celebrated our Christmas, they congratulated us, and now we are congratulating them on their Christmas. Easter sometimes can coincide and sometimes not, but it is very good that in recent years, Orthodox and Catholics have begun to be better with each other and to communicate and have become more friendly to each other. Maxim's friend Oleg says that his father is Orthodox and his mother is Catholic, and that he hopes that one day the church will be united. 
I think that in the 21st century, everyone can choose their religion. But of course, many peers, classmates, do not understand why I am Catholic. They are surprised to hear it. They are wondering who are the Catholics, because they do not understand who they are. They think that they are all pagans or someone else. In a few words, if we Christians will follow together the examples of saintly life, it will lead to true unity. First of all, I would like to mention that in the common declaration of Pope Francis and Patriarch Kirill, the theme of uh, saints was deliberately included. And they spoke about the uh, heritage of saints as our common heritage. For uh, a thousand years, uh, the churches each east and west uh, were together. And uh, during this time, uh, the saints who appeared in east and west were our common saints. Now, as uh, the Russian Orthodox Church continues to include Western saints of the first millennium in our calendar, uh, it is motivated uh, mostly by the requests of our people who are living in Western Europe, in America, in other places, and uh, who uh, venerate the local saints. Recently, the Orthodox Church accepted St. Patrick of Ireland and more than 15 other first millennium Western saints into its calendar. However, as Father Kirill says, there are also new saints of the second millennium that are worth discovering. Orthodox Christians, very difficult, it's very difficult to accept this tradition of our great mystics, like for example, St. Therese of Avila or San Juan de la Cruz, very important uh, persons for spiritual, uh, Catholic spiritual world, but sometimes very even suspicious for Orthodox Christians. And I believe that even making little by little the steps in knowing the actual uh, theology, actual belief of these people, we can not just kind of, um, kind of uh, schemas that we sometimes impose uh, thinking that we know everything beforehand without even knowing the real thing. So it is important to know more about this, this heritage of different saints of later times. Each saint has his or her own uh, character, charisma, uh, and uh, our relations with saints are always personal. And there are many Orthodox saints who are well known in the West, for example, Saint Seraphim of Sarov, who are respected and venerated by many Catholic Christians. And I believe that uh, the Russian Orthodox Church, during more than 1,000 years of its existence, uh, has developed a very special type of sanctity because they are very inspiring, they are uh, imbued with the uh, spirit of the gospel, and they help many Christians to discover their own uh, way towards God. After the Second Vatican Council, Pope St. Paul VI added some Russian Orthodox saints of the second millennium to the Catholic calendar. One of them is St. Sergius of Radonezh, the patron saint of Moscow. After a short break, you'll learn about how to become a saint from the Prefect of the Congregation for the Causes of Saints. There are two kinds of reasoning or two general ways of thinking. Venerable Archbishop Fulton Sheen will soon be beatified. 
Pope Francis approved the miracle attributed to the 20th century American bishop and television catechist on July the 6th. The decree of the Vatican's Congregation for the Causes of Saints describes the miracle of the unexplained recovery of a boy born stillborn in September of 2010 in the Peoria, Illinois area town of Goodfield. Archbishop Sheen was especially recognized for his evangelization work in radio and television. That's the joy of truth. A few days earlier, Pope Francis held an ordinary public consistory of cardinals in Rome to vote on moving ahead to the canonization of five blesseds, including an English cardinal, Blessed John Henry Newman. Pope Benedict, during his trip to England, beatified Cardinal Newman in 2010. And this year, Pope Francis will proclaim him a saint on October the 13th. Susan Hansen, professor of the University of Dallas, tells us what virtues paved the way for Cardinal Newman to be proclaimed a saint. Well, the first thing that comes to mind is the gift of tongues, um, because Cardinal Newman understood classical rhetoric. He understood the, the great um, literary works in English and Shakespeare and Milton and, and the poets of the 18th century. And so he really thought a lot about how to connect with different audiences. And I think that's, um, that's something that Pope Francis is asking of us, um, that we really need to reach out and to, um, and to connect with a lot of different audiences. And he really had the gift of tongue. So after 300 years of the Protestant Reformation, Newman is a figure who bespeaks a great second spring or third spring of English-speaking Catholicism. And I think in that way, he is a missionary. He's a missionary to the English-speaking world. And I think one of the things that he's important for is um, he talks to us about the importance of studying history to understand that the Catholic Church is not just a mystical body, but the Catholic Church is also a real institutional body that's defined by papal succession and defined by the Episcopal hierarchy, defined by the realities of real people trying to live their vocation as lay people, real people trying to live their vocation to the priesthood, that um, it's not just my individual, subjective, one-on-one -on -one relationship with Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. The Minister of Faith of Great Britain, Lord Byrne of Aberystwyth, told EWTN earlier this spring that the canonization of Cardinal Newman will be greatly appreciated by all the British. So something like that, honoring somebody from Britain, is something that's vastly welcomed, has a massive welcome throughout the country since he was a great Briton, and this is a way that he is being honored by, by the Pope and by the Catholic Church, so that can only be good news. Susanna believes that Cardinal Newman had a great influence on English writers of the 20th century. So he was very influenced by reading the early church fathers, so Athanasius, and St. Augustine in particular, I think were influences on Newman. And then Newman himself is very influential on Gerard Manley Hopkins, Ronald Knox, Christopher Dawson, J.R. Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, G.K. Chesterton. So he's, he definitely has a kind of paternity, right, between the early church and then, and then the 20th century um, Christian world in the English-speaking countries. For those not familiar with the works of Cardinal Newman, Susanna recommends to start with his autobiographical account, Apology of Pro Vita Sua. By reading this work, it will become clear why Cardinal Newman converted to Catholicism. discover the process of canonization causes and to explore better the model of holiness of Cardinal John Henry Newman, we met with the head of the Vatican's Congregation for the Causes of Saints, Cardinal Angelo Becciu. Il Beato John Henry Newman nacque in Inghilterra, Londra, il 21 aprile 1801. Il modello di santità di Newman modello di Newman's model of holiness is a model for those who have honestly sought the truth. That's what I'd say. He made the sense of his conscience prevail and then set out on a journey to discover the truth. 
He was first an Anglican, and then in study and meditation, he realized that in the Catholic Church he found the fullness of the model of the Church that Jesus Christ had planned. And therefore he lived coherently, before and after, because he was a man who cultivated the very primacy of conscience. I'd like to ask you, Your Eminence, how is this Congregation for Saints structured, and how does it work? It works as a Supreme Court, well, excuse the word court, but it is from there where the processes that lead to the sanctity of a candidate are examined. Because as we know, first there is the diocesan phase, and then there is the Roman phase. So the case ends here, which is all a journey that can last a few years, some even a few centuries, and some even 10 or 20 years. It is the final point of the whole process that begins in the diocese, then arrives here. And here the causes are examined by, if it's a question of miracles, there is the opinion of the doctors, then in the opinions of the theologians, and once they pass these two phases, then the dossier passes to the cardinals and the bishops. It is examined well in all its various aspects, and if there is an agreement, it is then passed on to the Holy Father, because it is he who decides in the end. Since the Second Vatican Council, with this decree for a universal call to holiness, how have these new causes of canonization changed? Since the Second Vatican Council, the number of saints has also increased, no longer just religious, but also lay people, fathers of families, doctors, young people, and, in short, a variety of God's people. Many times today we talk about the costs. We hear that costs are too high. Even Pope Francis spoke about that for a cause for canonization. Can the cost be an obstacle to advancing a cause for canonization? Well, no, but I think there's too much literature on this cost. First of all, we as a congregation are not involved, because it is the diocese that is the actor, the diocese of the, I would say, the association of the laity, or of the religious convents that take the initiative, and then the bishop who establishes the court in order to be able to carry out the cases. And then, behold, it is there that the bishop must see the prices, the costs, that he must do with the postulators, make a budget. In addition, there is a so-called free patronage. If a diocese really can't even bear the minimum that is required, from here what little one has, one makes available and tries to meet the needs of a diocese, of a convent. In short, what should be seen is the goodness of the cause, then the rest can be arranged. To do all this costs resources. How much could it cost, more or less? I know that these are not costs entirely held by the congregation. Well, there's a chart that I don't remember well. I don't know if, to make a cause in all, it will cost 15, 20,000 maximum euro. In these months of experience as prefect here in the congregation, you must have developed your own definition of holiness, even being a cardinal, a priest. What's your definition of holiness? Well, I would define holiness. Holiness, first of all, I say that speaking of holiness is difficult. For a de-Christianized world, it is difficult for me, but I would speak of models of holiness. Who became a saint? By now, one becomes a saint who has found an answer to his inner fundamental search. Therefore, one who has found in the Word of God the true answer to his needs, and is one who has taken this word seriously, and who has lived by maximum coherence and maximum radicality in the life of the Gospel. I wanted to ask for those who are not Catholics, is there any possibility of becoming saints? As observers of other religions, can they also be considered? Now, if one is not a member of the Catholic Church, it's not my duty to declare a member of another church holy, because the other church can always tell me, what do you have to do with us? So we respect, honor the saints of the Orthodox Church, and at the same time, we will emphasize perhaps that ecumenism of martyrdom, ecumenism of blood, and here we refer to Pope Francis. That is, many Catholics, Orthodox, Protestants have given their lives as a witness through fidelity to Jesus Christ. They have been killed precisely out of hatred for the faith, in hatred of Jesus Christ. 
in quale limite possono To what extent can sexual orientation be an obstacle to sainthood? Un ostacolo di, per la santificazione. Se vive bene il Vangelo, If he lives well the gospel, his chastity, living accordingly to God's will can be holy. But also those who define themselves as having other sexual tendencies, if he has heroically lived the gospel, has lived his chastity, this is God's judgment. If we talk about candidates for sainthood, if we look at their political nature, can it be considered if someone is involved in politics both positively or negatively for his cause? Well, if only we had holy politicians, eh? Because it means that they are men who live in the greatest disinterest, live in the service of their country and their fellow citizens, with great dedication and generosity, not so much for their own personal good or of that of their own party. One last question I wanted to ask. Pope Francis has made more saints than anybody else with the martyrs of Otranto. What makes him, let's say, unique and also how he speaks of the saints? Francis is very animated. Even those equipolent canonizations, he chooses figures for the man of today. What is Pope Francis' unique original touch for the saints? Well, if I can tell you in a few words that Pope Francis really wants men who touch the heart of man today, even the exhortations he's given, such as Gaudate in Exhortate. With that exhortation, he leads us to see the saint next door. They must be people who live everyday life, try to live holiness. And then for him are men who live the gospel radically, and live it especially intoxicated by God, and then totally dedicated to the least of people, to the people who suffer most in life. This seems to me to be the characteristic of Pope Francis. Grazie tanto per il suo tempo. Bene, grazie a voi e buon lavoro.